I get to introduce our next speaker. He saved the best, the very best for last. It's no secret <laughs> that uh, Not true. my favorite systems thinker is right here. So um, Dr. Laura Cabrera, who got all of her different degrees from Cornell University. Uh, she currently teaches, we teach together, the systems thinking and modeling and systems leadership at Cornell at the Brooks School of Public Policy. She's the program director for our uh, graduate certificate uh, program in systems thinking, modeling, and leadership. She, what we call STML. She also serves as faculty at SC Johnson College of Business, where she delivers executive education programs to executive teams in systems thinking and systems leadership. She's co-founder and chief research officer of Cabrera Research Lab. And really over the last two or more than two decades, Laura has applied her expertise in research method, methods and translational research to increase public understanding, um, practical application and dissemination of these sophisticated system science and systems thinking models. Uh, another way of saying that is if you appreciate that systems thinking over the last 25 years has become accessible, it's in large part because of Laura. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. For her thank talk. You. Uh, can you all see my slides? Yes, because this is this is the key moment where my lack of technology skills comes up. All right, so um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be here, obviously. I've said that all day. I'm going to give you sort of the greatest hits of our latest set of research studies, which are pulled from seven papers, uh, seven different published papers that for all of you out there in the audience, they will be made available uh, after the conference on the um, website. But today what I wanna do is I wanna talk about our specific research findings in systems thinking and DSRP theory, and just sort of highlight five things that these findings uh, will elucidate or talk about. First of all, the existence of DSRP in both mind and nature. Uh, also the findings about each pattern and their elements and interdependencies. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about how, these, uh, how this theory can increase cognitive complexity and talk some about the efficacy of being aware of DSRP and obviously what the implications are for the future. That's sort of the fun part. So what do I mean by both mind and nature? Well, I mean both the material and the cognitive. So when you see the acronym DSRP, I want you to think about this sentence. Information is selected, organized and interconnected by frames of reference. And there's an ongoing evergreen systems lit review that we've been doing as a team, which includes over 150 studies that indicate the existence of DSRP across disciplines. But I'm only gonna, I'm not gonna share 150. I'm just gonna share a few that have um, interesting results and that will sort of help elucidate the point of mind and nature. So the first one is that atoms have perspectives. Renowned physicist Freeman Dyson stated that the mind is already inherent in every electron and the processes of human consciousness differ only in degree, but not in kind from the processes of choice between quantum states, which we call chance. Do you hear the lawnmowers behind me? Seriously, great timing. I'm just gonna keep yelling. Well, so it's difficult to know if Dyson was speaking metaphorically or empirically, but later, Zwick's work answered the question empirically as their research made it clear that atoms have a sensory perspectival experience of their environment. And what Zick, Zick was really interested in was using um, quantum bits unique perspective to extract information about its environment to conclude that atoms are actually sensing through interactions much like we do their environment and then change their behavior accordingly. And therefore molecules, atoms and quarks have a frame of reference. And this means that the perspective pattern is fundamental, not just to the mind, but also in nature in the most fundamental elements of the universe itself. 
Second, another researcher, Chen, showed that molecules actually embody the relationship rule. And what he was really talking about, or what he explained was that bond breaking and forming are the essential components of chemical reactions. In other words, that bonds are synonymous with relationships. And we all know that atoms form relationships with each other to create molecules. But what Chen did is he used an atomic force microscope, the tip, to put mechanical force on the relationships between atoms to measure the strength of the, of the molecular bonds. And what this image shows, or what it contrasts, is the moment when the relationship is broken in the far right here. And in fact, what Chen also explained in his research is that those relationships are also distinguished and they include several parts, which means they're also systems. So I'm hoping you're starting to see what I mean by DSRP in nature. There was some other research by Tweedy et al. Um, who ran, these are both amoeba and cancer cells through mazes to see if they could solve them. And what he found is that both types of these non-neuronal cells were placed in mazes of varying complexity and they were actually able to solve them. In fact, the cells were able to identify the optimal path showing that these cells actually have the ability to make distinctions between the areas of high and low concentration to find their way to the end of the maze. So what this tells us is cells also work together as part whole systems to find those optimal paths through the maze. They also distinguish the previous paths taken by the cells in front of them, which is meaning that they're taking a perspective because they're sensing the gradients of chemicals at key junctions in the maze, which cause them to have greater success with navigating the maze. So what this research shows is that non-neuronal cells possess a limited but unique perspective from which they're able to make distinctions and organize their environment into part whole systems to navigate perspectively through their worlds. It's amazing, right? All right, and finally, I gotta talk about birds, some sort of an organism, right? Birds take perspectives, that's not surprising, but it is equally interesting. So Endler researched the fascinating mate display building behavior of bowerbirds. And what they do is they build what's called a bower. You can see in this picture. They decorate their bower with the series of uncolored and colored objects, taking the perspective of color into account. But great bowerbirds take another perspective, which is size. You can see in this middle image, they organize the colorless objects by increasing the size further away from the bower, which creates a geometric pattern. And this can actually allow a male bird to create what's called a forced perspective to entice the females into their bower. I know it's a little shady, but still it's pretty fascinating, right? What's interesting is some of the bower birds, like you can see in the far image on the right, they dive deeper into the perspective of color and they sort their brightly colored objects um, by color and by size in the, on the right. And all of these perspectives are taken in order to attract more mates. And research actually shows that it works because the male bowerbirds are not only using a perspective to make the nest more appealing, they're also using that forced perspective, which actually demonstrates that they have a theory of mind. And not surprisingly, the birds who are better at creating these displays and taking multiple, multiple perspectives, they get more mates overall. So our research, the stuff that I wanna to highlight today includes close to 30 studies that answer two questions. Does DSRP exist? In other words, can it be observed empirically? And is it effective? Meaning does being aware of DSRP increase somebody's cognitive abilities? So to understand these two questions, we have to understand what DSRP says, and even more importantly, what it implies or predicts, because it's the predictions that we can test and verify in our work. So each of the studies I'm about to highlight is really attempting to answer a few things. First, how and why distinctions, systems, relationships, or perspectives form what the internal and external dynamics are of each of those patterns and how they, how they interact with another, with one another. We're also gonna look at the role that distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives play in both individual and social cognition. 
and the role they play in metacognition. And finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about the effects of metacognitive awareness of DSRP on cognitive complexity and fluid thinking. So all of the research was completed through a variety of methods, which include quasi-experimental and experimental designs, depending on the condition of knowledge. This is about 24 of the studies. And they all included generalizable sample sizes ranging from 350 people to almost 35,000 people. And this was based on a normal distribution to the US population. It also draws on that literature review and the meta-analysis of the 150 studies I mentioned previously. And just to sort of give you the punchline at the beginning, the first set of basic research studies showed to a highly statistically significant degree that the DSRP patterns do exist, much like gravity exists. And what really matters is whether one is aware of their existence or not. The second set of applied research studies showed that these patterns of, of cognition, when utilized purposefully or as skills and with awareness or consciousness, they are effective to a highly statistically significant degree. So what this means is all of this work supports the existence and effectiveness of DSRP theory. And importantly, it confirms that we can actually say DSRP is a theory. Now to the general public, theory often means a, a hypothesis, an educated guess, or an opinion. We sometimes use air quotes, but in science, theory is a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses that have been tested and is evidenced by an accumulation of empirical research. And in the field of systems thinking, there are few empirically validated theories to speak of. We do have a plurality of excellent methods, but we felt we needed to go further in our own work. So if I was lucky enough to have you in the audience last year at our conference, you might recall a couple of prior findings that I'm gonna highlight so that we can ground what we're about to talk about in this. So the first thing I told you last year is that in less than one minute treatment of learning only one of the patterns of thinking, we saw significant increases in cognitive complexity in samples of people. The second thing that I highlighted was that we now understand people's thinking patterns more broadly and that was based on a study of over 34,000 people. And that those patterns helped us to identify a very specific set of skills that we can develop to help people become better systems thinkers. So all of that understanding of thinking habits has given us insight into how to improve systems thinking in practice. Also, I just want to remind us this bottom right image that we are seeing a Dunning-Kruger effect, the bias where our confidence in systems thinking is actually higher than our actual competence in systems thinking. And you all know the dangers of being out of sync of reality, especially when we think we're better thinkers than we actually are. And systems thinking is a way that we can bring our competence in alignment with our confidence. So let's extend this a little further. I'm gonna dive into some highlights of our newest findings for each of these patterns, just by highlighting a couple of studies. So this is where the great sits are coming. So put your seatbelt on, because it's a lot of stuff, but it's gonna be fun. We're gonna start with distinctions. And one thing I wanna make sure that we are reminding ourselves of is that of that, when we sampled those 34,000 people, um, we did realize that 48% of people, when they're asked to think about something, get stuck or they freeze up and they end up doing nothing. But what's really interesting is the 52% of people who did do something, the thing they did is they made distinctions. We also know from this research that we fall short in making distinctions in that we rarely consider the other, like the identity and the other. We don't always acknowledge what the other is or who the other is. And we rarely challenge or validate the identities that we make. Of interesting, what's also interesting is we make distinctions by taking information in with all five of our senses, right? Our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our, you know, our nose and touch. And what I wanna do just for a quick minute is have you look at a series of images I'm gonna click through. And I want you to just note in your own mind the moment where you zeroed in on the distinction that you're making. Are you ready? I'm waiting for a thumbs up. Are we ready? Yes, thank you, Natasha. So here we go. 
So here's an image. We're going to zoom in and then bam. Right? That's where you likely confirmed the distinction tennis ball. And I'm hoping this shows you that we define things using information to help us determine what things are. And what our research shows is we also distinguish things based on what things are not. In the dog tree burger study, we're very good at naming our studies, 374 participants were shown three familiar images, a dog, a tree, and a hamburger. They were then asked to check all of the boxes that define each of these items. And they were given the following answer choices, dog, tree, burger, not a dog, not a tree, and not a burger. And what the data shows based on the pattern of responses is that participants not only identify common objects by what they are, but also by what they're not. Thus, not a tree and not a burger, or not a burger are also terms for dog and vice versa. And what this means is that each of these things had both an identity and also co-identities. So for example, the identity dog had two co-identities, not tree and not burger. And this can be true of all sorts of things. What this study also shows is that tree and burger are both not dog. And that establishes a part whole set of things that are not dog, showing that the other is often a system of others because the identity not dog is made up of two parts, tree and burger. The next study, so we see from that that we identify objects by what they are and also what they're not. In this next study, the, the orange polyhedra study, participants were asked four questions about the same image of an orange polyhedra. And they, this involved clicking and naming the objects. So these are actually heat map images. So first, participants were asked to click on the object and name it. 100% of people were able to do that. Participants were then asked to click on the not object and name it, and 89% of people were able to do that. Another question asked participants to click on the white space and name it, and 83% of people were able to do that. And then finally, we asked participants to click on the not white space and name it, the far right, and only 52% of people could do that. And what we found is that people have an easier time identifying and naming objects than they do not objects. So in other words, when the identity is an object, they do better. When the identity is a not object, they do worse. And interestingly, when the other is an object, they do better. But when the other is a not object, they do far worse. So the results of this study indicate that any identity, no matter, no matter how discrete, like the orange polyhedra, or indiscrete, like the empty white space, can be perceived as an other or a not identity. So we often shift identity and other in our minds, which is likely causing disclarity in our thinking. We then wanted to test what would happen if we gave people a non-distinguished object in what we call the inkblot study. So 374 participants, participants were shown a traditional Rorschach and asked to describe what they saw. And what this data indicated is that something non-discrete and abstract like an inkblot can yield dramatically different and similar distinctions among individuals. In other words, people distinguish this same thing differently in their individual responses, which were things like body part, stingray, ink blot, crab, elf, bug, and so on and so on. But in the aggregate, these responses are similar because they fall into categories like person, thing, or animal, each of which received 25 to 35% of the responses. So in other words, at the individual level, people make a diversity of distinctions and collectively they see things similarly. Now there are a number of things we can now say empirically about distinctions. 
But in the interest of time, I'm just going to summarize and point you to the various published papers so that we can get through all of the different studies that I want to highlight. So basically, what it comes down to is identity, other distinctions are a universal cognitive structure. What's also interesting, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is that distinctions are highly dependent on systems, relationships, and perspectives. And we know that if we're aware of the distinctions that we're making, it will increase our, uh, the, the complexity of our cognition and, uh, and thinking. Now let's talk about systems. Part whole systems are foundational to a, a diverse amount of phenomena like belonging and containment, um, reductionism, holism, and it's basal if not synonymous with sets, sorts, groups, et cetera, et cetera. Now, remember that in that study of 34,000 people, what we found is that 52% of people who did do something made distinctions, and half of those people were able to break their distinctions down into parts. So it's something we do, but we do it less frequently than um, distinction making. And what people do not do when they're thinking about part whole systems is they, re they rarely challenge the way or consider the alternative ways that parts can be organized into wholes. And they frequently don't see things across levels of scale, you know, plus one or minus one when they're thinking about part whole systems. We frequently forget to relate the parts uh, of systems. And let's look at some of the research on, on S and I'll show you. Um, I'm gonna show you a question. I'm gonna give you a minute to take a, a second and answer it in your mind, and then I'll tell you about the results. So here's the question. Um, this is just a simple fill in the blank. So if you look at this image and think about what is your answer choice? And what you find is that 88% of participants were able to choose the correct answer. And what that means or what that indicates is that they were able to construct a part whole system by sorting and grouping the sets and also using relationships, even if it was unconscious to them, to come to that correct answer. And what this does is it, is it supports the hypothesis that um, part whole systems exist universally and are sort of basal to logic, reasoning, and problem solving. And this is one of the things that shows that part whole systems are dependent on relationships, distinctions, and perspectives. You couldn't have answered the question uh, without that. Now, the next two slides I'm gonna share with you are studies where we ask participants to sort things. First, they were not given a perspective from which to group things. Um, and then the next one I'm gonna show you is a study where they were given a perspective from which to group things. So in this first study, participants were given six objects, a wrench, a pen, a broom, a mop, a hammer, and a pencil. They were asked to group them and name the groupings that they made across these um, items. Now, what's interesting is we had a, over 300 participants and they took only six items and were able to uh, group them into more than 243 unique groups with different names. Names like tools, writing implements, cleaning supplies, office supplies, things like that. What that indicates is that part whole grouping is a function of distinctions. So in other words, when people grouped an item, which is a part, into a newly named group, which is a whole, the group itself became a new identity other distinction. So this shows that a set of six identities could be grouped into a number of part whole system structures, or 200 of them, depending on the unique perspective taken by the participants when they were sorting the items. What this means is that a list of items or identities is not inherently part of a category. Rather, things are grouped according to the relationships highlighted by the participant's perspective. So part whole grouping into systems is a function of relationships and perspectives. And this should make us a little bit more skeptical of the idea of one right answer because answers are often really sensitively dependent on these codependencies of D, S, R, and P. So in other words, this study shows that we have the ability to group stuff into systems using our own perspectives. Whereas this next study is gonna show that we can easily sort stuff from a perspective that's given to us. So in the sort button study, 
another great name, right? Three different experiments were conducted in which participants were asked to sort buttons into groupings from three perspectives, color, size, and the number of holes on the button. And like the, previously, the previous study, we saw that part hole grouping forms as a function of individual perspectives. And several aspects of these button studies illustrate that the way that participants do part hole grouping is a function of the relationships they're making. What's interesting is it's unclear which comes first. Is it a relationship that leads to a part hole grouping? Or is it a part whole grouping that leads to the recognition of a relationship among things? So in the two cases we're talking about of grouping items in the sort stuff studies, so with the wrench, pen, et cetera, when we group that into new named groups, that's a relationship leading to a grouping. But in the case of the button studies, we see that predetermined holes lead to the identification of relationships of similarity among the buttons. So the latter example actually means that pre-named groups are utilized as perspectives to identify relational characteristics in the buttons. So part whole grouping occurs in both directions and is much more likely to be the emergent property of a relationship and a perspective interacting with each other. So there are a number of things we can say empirically about part whole systems. These are all included in the papers that you're welcome to get uh, after the conference. But in the interest of time, what we really wanna see about part whole systems is that they're universal. They're dependent on distinctions, relationships, and perspective. Also, because part whole groupings are dependent on distinctions, relationships, and perspectives, what we see is that people part whole things differently into a diversity of groupings. But we also see that people part whole things the same inside of those differences. And that being aware of how we're think, how we're organizing and, and connecting ideas uh, will increase our cognitive complexity. All right. So we're gonna talk about action reaction relationships, which are synonymous with connection, integration, affiliations, those kinds of things. And what's interesting about relationships is Look at the slide, only 23% of the sample related things at all, and only 13% of the sample of 34,000 um, distinguish the relationships they were making. When I say distinguish the relationship they're making, I mean naming it, giving it some um, a label and, and sort of diving deeper into what the relationship actually is. Not just saying two things are related, but saying how they're related. So just think about this for a second and take a minute to sort of think about this. If you had a team of 10 people on a project, this would mean that only two people in your team had related things when they were discussing the work that you're doing on a project. Only two out of 10 are actually thinking about uh, relationships when they're looking at work. And when we think about relationships, there's a couple of things we need to rem remind ourselves. First of all, we only occasionally make relationships. And when we do make relationships, we commonly fail to explicate the relationships that matter. We don't usually seek out webs of causality, which you'll hear a lot about tomorrow. And you know, we need to build systems thinking habits to improve both the quality and the effect of our work. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about what we know empirically about relationships. First, in this study, we asked respondents to simply identify A, as depicted in three different ways in relation to other squares, which were labeled B and C. And what the responses across the group really illustrate is the relational nature of distinction making and, the, and that making relationships is empirical. So A in this slide is distinguished, not merely based on what it is, which is a square, but also in relation to the other objects it's with, meaning it's either the large or the smaller square, depending on the things around it. So what these responses show is that the way people distinguish things is based on not only the essence of the thing itself, but also on how those things relate to other things in that context around them. Meaning, what that means is that meaning making is relational in nature and objects or ideas have co-priming effects of action and reaction on each other. which gets us to love this dog, right? 
the dog lab coat study, which further tested the effects of co-primes on how we relate ideas. We set out to test the effect one idea has on our way of thinking about another idea. And what we found with statistical significance is that relationships are made up of an action and a reaction that mutually influence how we define concepts. So we started by establishing a baseline of how people described each one of these things without any co-prime. And the majority of answers basically said that dogs are animals, coats, when they thought of coat, most, most people thought of them as warm winter coats with hoods and fur. And most people had the mental model that lab was like a scientific lab with beakers and chemicals and all of that. So that was the baseline of how people were thinking about these things. The next few slides I'm gonna show you are going to highlight the effect that co-priming had on people's construct of dog, lab, or coat. And I'll talk about the biggest shifts as we go. So this is when we asked respondents to describe coat when they were co-primed with the idea lab. And what you see is the coat, which was previously described as a winter coat, became a white laboratory coat. And this illustrates the effect of the interaction of the two ideas together, which form a new mental model of coat. We then asked respondents to describe the lab when they were co-primed with the word dog. And what happened there is the lab, which was previously a scientific laboratory, became either a Labrador retriever or more creatively, a dog sitting in a scientific lab. So this also shows the effect of dog as a co-priming on the concept of lab. And finally, we explored the effect of dog as a co-prime of the concept of coat. And when co-primed with dog and coat and asked to describe the coat, the coat, which was previously a winter coat, became the fur of the dog or creatively a dog wearing a fur coat. So I want you to understand that this is happening all the time. We are frequently making relationships between and among things which are changing the mental models and the way that we think about things. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right, so there are a number of things that we can say empirically about action reaction relationships. But the, to really highlight some of the bigger points, they are universal. They are dependent on distinction systems and perspectives. But pay attention because whenever two things share the same physical or conceptual space, they always have the potential for a relationship. And this has a lot of implications for bias, teaching and learning, marketing and all kinds of things. And in the process of making distinctions, I'm sorry, in the process of making relationships, people rely on distinctions, right? And that relationships and distinctions are highly related, are highly connected. The relationality of ideas and objects can completely transform how we think about those things. And being aware of the relationships that we're making, in particular, explicating them and thinking more deeply about what they are and how they are structured will significantly increase your cognitive complexity and your metacognitive abilities in and of themselves. And finally, we're gonna talk about perspective. Perspective is sort of central to the field of systems thinking. Perspective taking is the cognitive act that underlies a lot of positive and negative phenomena. For example, empathy, compassion, analytics. It also underlies bias, stereotypes, discrimination, prejudice. So what I want you to really think about is that perspective in and of itself is not inherently, inherently positive or negative. It sort of has both in it. And not surprisingly, but of particular concern is if you look back at where we started, of the 52% of people who did do something when they were thinking something through, Perspective was the least frequent cognitive act they did. Only 8% of the sample took a perspective. And if you look even further down, only 2% 2 2 of the people distinguished their perspective. So this means in a group of 10 policymakers sitting around a table, less than one of them is taking a perspective, statistically speaking. So just let that sink in for a moment. Less than one is taking a perspective, statistically speaking. That's crazy. What's most important is we know 
that people can develop skills and systems thinking to make better decisions that are in alignment with reality. And most notably, what we know we need to do is teach people to look at things from multiple perspectives and to also teach people to take conceptual perspectives on issues more often. And this blue orange study, another great name, does just that. It shows that people can readily use perspective, in this case, a conceptual perspective, to only see blue, which highlights and lowlights certain identities in a given system. You see that almost 90% of people correctly saw only the four blue squares. We also conducted a bunch of studies um, using the fish tank imagery to test perspective taking skills. And we asked participants to click on several different types of things in the image from a variety of perspectives, but I'm only gonna highlight a couple, um, which I think have really interesting results. And we can, all of these are in the papers if you wanna read the full study. So first, this top image um, shows the heat map of responses when people were asked to click on an eyeball. 92% of people correctly click on an eyeball when they were prompted with that as perspective. Now remember, eyeballs are visible in the image, so they just clicked on it. What's really interesting is that they all clicked on the same one, which is not something that I would have thought about, but it makes sense given their line of sight probably into the image. Now contrast that to the second image, which shows that 82% of people correctly clicked on the area of a fish where its liver would be when prompted to look from the perspective of a liver. What's important to really think about is livers are not visible in this image, which means people had to imagine that part to find it, which means perspectives can go so far as to cause people to see things that are not even visible. We then tested if people could take both anthropomorphic and conceptual perspectives on the same image and see different things. And what this shows is how a single distinct distinction, whether it's the perspective of a fish or a financial perspective, which is a conceptual perspective, um, per, when you provide a different perspective point, which is fish or financial, it completely alters the DSRP configuration of what they're looking at. In other words, when we change the perspective from which we're looking at things, the things that we're looking at change. We see different distinctions, different systems, different relationships. And one of my favorite, and the last one I'll talk about in perspective, is the what's a bat study. People were asked to identify this object in three different stages. At the baseline, when they were not primed with any perspective or context cue, 96% uh, of people said that that object is a bat. When they were primed with the context of an intruder breaking into their home, that 96% changed to 44% of people saying that that bat was a weapon. When we changed the context again to being lost in the woods and cold, 61% of the people now labeled the bat as firewood. So what this means is that, is that perspectives are not static. They can actually change when the context in which they occur changes and they can change the context. So perspectives are very much driven, driven by context and, and other things in the system. There are a number of things we can say empirically about point view perspectives and they're all listed out in the papers, but I wanna just highlight a few things. First, they are universal cognitive structure. That's what this data shows, what this research shows. Perspectives are also like the other three dependent on distinction systems and relationships. They're all mutually dependent on one another. Explicit use of perspectives can be used very, very um, successfully to either constrain or expand thought. And we can actually get better at doing point view thinking. And we need to, because people have, as we know, greater confidence than they do confidence in perspective taking. And this overconfidence can be very problematic in many of the arenas that we all are living and working in. And we know that being aware of point view perspectives will definitely increase metacognition and cognitive complexity. 
And being aware of these four rules, DSRP, is what we call metacognition. And all of the summary of the metacognition research shows that when we have insight into our own thoughts or our metacognition, it leads to higher achievement in all sorts of domains. In other words, if we understand how we're thinking, um, we will do much better or fare much better in the things that we're thinking about. So I promised you I was gonna talk about the implications of what all of this means. The first thing, which is um, really kind of important is that we have a theory. Systems thinking as a field has a, a theory. A theory is important. And the reason a theory is important is because it drives progress. Darwin once wrote about the theory of evolution, quote, he said, at last, I had a theory with which I could work. The great biologist um, Dobzhansky exclaimed, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolutionary theory. And then also we know Kurt Lewin proposed that there's nothing more practical than a good theory. So the good news is we now have a proper theory of systems thinking, a model that is supported by empirical evidence from which we can work. And what we mean now, or what we know now, is that we can say what systems thinking is. Second, there is empirical evidence not only that the hypothesis and predictions made by the DSRP theory are correct, but also that the awareness of the DSRP theory shows a significant effect even in a very small treatment. What this means is that because we, we, we know what systems thinking is, we can actually teach it. We can develop systems thinking skills and systems thinkers because it has an effect it is significantly effective at increasing one's cognitive complexity, adaptivity, and the robustness of their thinking. And as Derek mentioned in his talk earlier this morning, what all of this research shows is that systems thinking is complex and adaptive. It's an emergent property of the simple rules, DSRMP. And we can practice those simple rules by practicing what we call moves. And finally, it's really clear <laughs> that society and humankind um, has a lot of challenges, crises, and wicked problems. We need systems thinking. We need to become systems thinkers. To solve these wicked problems, crises, and grand challenges, we will need to use systems thinking to identify webs of solutions to address webs of causes. In other words, we don't need only experts who are systems thinkers. We need a society made up of systems thinkers. Eight billion of them would be great. So thank you so much. That was fun. I hope it wasn't drinking from a fire hose. I see my moderator is doing the moderator magic move. And I'm back. He's back in black. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So we have lots of questions. Oh, good. So did, you, did you unshare that? Uh, I can't. Uh oh. As I'm choking. Moderator choking. Uh, share screen. Oh, yeah. stop. We stop. Can pin. Okay, good. We can pin. All right. <laughs> so um, let's let's go to. There's so many good questions. Um, so many good thinkers out there. So. Um, you talked about the research being existence and effectiveness. Those are the two sort of things in our research agenda. And by exist, do you mean that identity, other distinctions, part, whole systems, action, reaction, relationships, and point view perspectives can be observed in the population universally? Yeah, I mean, I would say that all of our different studies based on the sample sizes and the statistical analysis that we did really shows that we all, these patterns exist in all of us. They are the way that we think and build mental models and that that can be generalized to all the population. Does that answer your yep. question? Yeah. Okay. And then by effective, you mentioned that it was just a, in this particular case, it was literally a one minute or less than one minute intervention Obviously, most times educational curriculum would be far more than one yes. minute. But what does this mean 
you know, for educational, you know, programming or, or curriculum? Well, it means a lot. So first of all, the the effect that we saw after just one minute intervention in one of the patterns thinking to me was remarkable. Um, and it really gave me hope that things like full on educational curriculums or embedding systems thinking into things like the common core standards or longer trainings and interventions give us hope and, and an impetus for really developing systems thinking at a much bigger scale and with greater efficiency and speed. So I was very encouraged by those results. Um, um, and, you know, if you think about, if you think about what's most important, if you think about how, oh, how would I say this? How difficult the last five years or so have been for all of us. It seems to me if we could really start to actively work on developing um, systems thinkers that we could really get ourselves out of these situations much more quickly. So I'm very excited about it. Excellent. Uh, one of the audience asked, did DSRP emerge from these studies or was the research confirmation of the DSRP construct? So um, these studies set both null and alternative hypotheses from which DSRP emerged, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> That's a good question. One audience made a, just a, I think it's more of a comment than a question, uh, but I'm not sure what it's referring to. This is the crux. Teams often form themes based on bias and preconceived notions, i.e. they form the label before the essence of the data emerges. The relationship and attributes of the data should form the group or the part whole system. Yes. Causality should only come much later once the attributes of the part group is is clear. Thank you for addressing this. You want to comment on no, that? No, I to I totally agree. And, and we see this all the time where um, you know, distinction where problems emerge because we've started to um label things and distinguish things far sooner than we've actually understood all the constituent parts of that thing itself. And so we do we do really think that it's important that we pay attention to each other's mental models. What are the parts of that system? What would we call that system? We have found many times when we're working with executive groups that you can be an hour into a conversation and realize that two people have all the same parts of a system, but they have totally different names for it. And it just has caused thinking errors all the way down and conflict. And so I think that's a great a great comment. <clears throat> um, so there's a question, are there other theories of systems thinking, other constructs? Um, and, and generally speaking, along those lines, um, for those new to systems thinking, they may not understand why DSRP is different uh, from what has been proposed prior. Um, Aside from its empirical basis, which is unique, mm -hmm. uh, and which you mentioned uh, that other systems models don't have, what makes DSRP different from other systems models? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, it's what you talked about actually in your talk, that systems thinking is, is itself a complex adaptive system. And systems thinking is the emergent outcome of applying the simple rules of making distinctions organizing systems, seeing relationships, and taking perspectives. Um, and what this what this means is it leads to, like you were talking about, this massively in the moment, adaptive and fluid thinking, right? And the other thing I like about the way that we think about systems thinking and, and is that it's not like a framework or a model. It's more of a set of rules that can lead to solutions rather than fit systems, shoehorn systems into a particular framework or model. We often miss the totality of a system um, because we're trying to fit it into something that's sort of pre, I don't want to say ordained, but pre-fit, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think, I, you know, and I'm going to say this over and over again, it's going to get annoying, but the thing that I think is great, my favorite thing is when we really realized from 35,000 people what people tend to do and not to do, and that we were able to reduce that to a set of very specific skills that are able to be developed and that are able be, to be taught in, you know, at the ground level as moves and skills. And so to me, that's that's the crux of it all. Yeah. Being able to teach people because we need to. 
Yeah, and it, uh, along those lines of the of the question that the person asked, um, I mean, it is you know sometimes you feel bad coming out and saying like this this systems model doesn't have empirical research, but oh, yeah. there's yeah at, at, if somebody's going to invest their time in in a systems thinking ag agenda, you would hope that it has empirical research, and it's actually surprising. And we've done quite a bit of background research, right? To yes, we have how little research or some, sometimes zero research various yes. uh, frameworks yes. have. Well, so, you know, I didn't come up the ranks as system, like looking at system sciences, I sort of crossed paths with you. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is a very important distinction for people to make, in particular, people who are new to systems thinking, is there are a variety of really useful and valid methods inside of the systems thinking field that apply to very specific contexts and are very useful. That's different than an underlying set of principles or rules that can actually, that actually undercut all of those methods and that actually develop an awareness of how you're building meaning of things, how you're thinking about systems. So I, I think it's important to differentiate methods from theory. The methods are valid. The methods are great for what they're designed for, but they're not something that are foundational to what we mean by systems thinking. They're extensions of systems thinking, as I guess what I would say. Yeah. We have time. For my answer. How many questions, questions do we have? Oh, just one. Just just one geez, because we have a lot of them. Um, you got to pick one good. Wow, one. there's some really good ones. Uh, well, I. Uh, I guess I would ask you this one, which is um, how do you, it, it, this, the question is, do you think this is more important than STEAM training or you know, STEM and the arts? Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you're familiar with, with the study on emotional intelligence, the meta-analysis. And so a lot of times people think, oh, should I, if I want to teach STEM science, or if I want to, or STEAM science, or I want to teach emotional intelligence, yeah. then shouldn't I teach emotional intelligence, or mm -hmm. shouldn't I teach STEM right. science? And and they're surprised when they find out that metacognition, yeah, you know, has know, yeah. greater uh, greater effects. Yeah. So um, so I so for the audience, what you're referring to is there was a a very um, well known and comprehensive study around um, how to develop emotional intelligence. And what they actually found was that if you wanna develop emotional intelligence, things like compassion and empathy um, and those kinds of things, rather than teach compassion and empathy directly, you're better to actually develop and teach metacognition to people because at the root of compassion and empathy are things like perspectives and relationships. So if we get good at these four things, they underlie all of these other skills that we're trying to develop. They also, not just EI, scientific thinking, critical thinking, creativity, all of those things have at their base, the elements of making distinctions, organizing systems, relationships, and perspectives. So we're better to learn these four foundational things and get all of the benefits upstream of the fact that they are related and underlie all these other types of thinking. Well, I hate to pass over some of these questions because there's some great questions in there, but we don't have enough time. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer them uh, uh, at some point during the conference. Um, but we did but promise to be done by. We promised that we would be done.